That was a wonderful time of singing. I thank God for this opportunity. It's a great joy and privilege to be able to share God's word this evening. Please turn to Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to start reading from verse 4 up to verse 17. Kindly follow it in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Have you ever made a choice or taken a decision that you later regretted? I'm not talking about the small choices that we make every day, I'm not talking about the little trivial choices. Imagine if you go to carnival for an ice cream and you choose your ice cream and place the order but later on you realize that someone else has ordered something better this happens to me all the time and for the rest of the evening you regret your choice that's not the kind of choice I'm talking about talking about a choice that maybe come, comes back to haunt you, maybe for the rest of your life. Talking about a choice that if you could go back in time and just undo that one decision, oh, your life would be so different. The trajectory of your life would be so different. Choices are important especially because they affect other people as well. There is no such thing as, I've made my choice, I'll bear the consequences, that's it. There's no such thing as that. Imagine dropping a stone into a pond. You have control over the choice of dropping a stone. 
you have no control over the ripple effect that the stone creates. The choices that we make are a little bit like that. We have a little bit of control over the choice, no control whatsoever about the impact of the choices that we make. This evening, my prayer is that we will be people who make good choices. Maybe there will be someone here who makes a choice that will change the trajectory of your life. I want to talk this evening about a couple called Adam and Eve. They had a choice that they had to make. It was probably the most consequential choice, consequential decision ever taken by anyone in the history of the human race. The impact of their choice affected them, affected the human race, affected the animal kingdom, affected nature. Their choice just affected every single thing. I'm sure there may be one or two people here thinking back of a choice and regretting how it made an impact on someone else. Well, spare a moment and think about Adam and Eve. Their choice affected the sun, the moon, the fish in the sea, the planets. If there's someone crying because they've lost their father or their mother, ah, that all goes back to a choice made by one person. Death, sin, sorrow, loneliness was all because of that choice. Why am I talking about an ancient, ancient story? Adam and Eve is one of the most ancient stories, not just in the Bible, but in literature. It's an old, old story. Why am I going back to this story? Uh, it's because the ripple effect of the choice that Adam and Eve made affects you as well. It's not just their story. You are part of this story. You were impacted by the choice that Adam and Eve made. Just like they made a decision, just like they made a choice, you also have a choice this evening. Adam was told, do not eat from this tree. I'm going to explain in a little more detail. But God comes and tells Adam, do not eat from this tree. If you do, you will die. You have a choice as well. God comes and tells you, eat from this tree. I'll explain in more detail. If you eat, you will live. That's the choice that you have this evening. And I'm going to explain that in greater detail. So let's try and follow this story. I think the best way to understand this passage, I've read a, just a small section of the whole story. The best way to understand this passage is to think of it as a drama. In verse 16, God comes and speaks. He speaks for the first time in this story. What is happening in the verses prior to God speaking? The writer is setting the stage. He's telling us what is there in the drama. He's describing the props. Imagine if you sit down at a, to watch a drama and the curtains open. The first thing you see is the setting the different props. And then against that backdrop, people start speaking. And the drama makes sense in light of the setting behind the person speaking. So in the first few verses, the writer is simply describing what is there. And then God comes and speaks in verse 16. So let's quickly have a look at 
the various things that the writer is pointing out. Look at verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. First thing you can notice here is that there is a repetition here. He's saying the same thing twice. Earth and the heavens, heavens and the earth. The second time he's reversing the form. In a modern translation, the typesetting is very different. Why they are doing that is the ancient writer, Moses, he's signaling to us that a new section is beginning here. There are 10 sections in the book of Genesis, all of them opening with the lines, these are the generations. Then we have the Adam story, then the Noah story, Abraham, Joseph, so on. There are 10 such stories in the book of Genesis. It's worth looking at that word generation. What does that word generation mean? In chapter 1, God created the world because he created the world. From that emerges the Adam and Eve story. From that is generated the Adam and Eve story. I could say I deposited a million rupees and generated an interest coming out of it. That's the word generation. Because God created the world, now we have this first story of the first couple, Adam and Eve. So let's think about this story. God creates Adam and Eve, places them in this beautiful garden called Eden. In the Hebrew, Eden means delight. There is also a very close Sumerian language. And in this Sumerian language, Eden means paradise, abundance. So when the early readers, early listeners to this story heard the word Garden of Eden, what they are picturing is a beautiful garden, a paradise garden. God is creating this beautiful place and putting Adam and Eve there to enjoy this garden and live. Verse 5, when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. The rest of creation was dry and parched outside Eden. God didn't want to put Adam in a parched, dry land and say, be a gardener here. God is watering this garden, making it fertile, getting it ready for Adam so that his work will be satisfying, his work will be a pleasure. In chapter 1, we are told God created man in God's image and he was told have dominion over the earth. Well, here is Adam having dominion. God places Adam to work the ground. Adam's job, what is his job? He's a gardener. His job is to till the soil and make this garden beautiful, bring order to this garden. God started that work. He created Adam in his image, gave him dominion and said, now you continue with the work. If you water the ground, I'm guessing it'll be quite muddy. It says there was a mist going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. So I'm guessing the ground was quite muddy. Out of the mud, God creates man. 
The word for dust, mud, clay, very similar. God makes Adam out of the dust from the ground. The word dust in the Bible is linked with mortality, from dust to dust. The word dust is linked to fallibility, weakness. Human beings, we are made up of the stuff of this world. We are connected in a very deep way to this world. We are connected to the animal kingdom. That's what it means by we're made from dust, the lowest of the low. But to this dust, God breathes the breath of life. We are created in God's image. We are beings who can decide to do something, decide not to do something. We have agency, moral agency. I'm trying to not use the word free will, but man has moral agency. God created him and breathed the breath of life into Adam. Verse 9, and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Here we see again God is trying to make a beautiful garden pleasing to the eye aesthetically pleasing fruits were good for food God wants to create a wonderful place for Adam and Eve so that they can live and enjoy their life the tree of life was in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The writer at this point just leaves it at that. There is not much description at this point. He's just telling there is a prop like that on the stage. The little clue is that it's in the middle of the garden. I'm guessing that if it's in the middle of the garden, it's, if it's in the center of the garden, it must be the center of the story as well. We're getting a little bit of a hint that these two trees are going to be important in this story. The tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. We we'll skip to verse 14. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Do you notice that the writer is giving us names that we can actually locate on a map? Not saying that we can, we've got the coordinates where we can exactly pinpoint where it is, but the point is this, it is somewhere there on the map. That is the purpose of some of these names which are very recognizable to us even though some of them are unknown, like Havila, Pishon. The next bit is a little bit surprising. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Isn't that surprising? What is gold doing in a story like this? You see, simply giving facts, geological facts. Maybe Moses is into geology and is giving us information that there's gold there. Or perhaps it's part of him saying, look, it's an actual place. 
there's gold there, you can touch it. This is an actual place. Is that what he's getting at? I'm not sure, maybe. There's a, another option which connects to the story, which I kind of like. Let me share it with you. In the previous chapter, God says, Adam, fill the earth, multiply, have dominion. I am making a wonderful, beautiful, delightful garden for you. There are these beautiful trees. Enjoy the fruit. In a few verses time, he's going to be introduced to Eve, this wonderful companion. This is going to be an adventure. Adam, you follow me, you obey me, you fill the earth and keep multiplying. What happens if you keep multiplying? If you notice the gold is outside the land, what happens if you grow and grow and grow? Well, you eventually come to the gold. Maybe God is saying, Eve, Eden is a wonderful garden, but even outside, keep growing, Adam. Keep multiplying. Eden is wonderful, but outside there is wonderful things to discover as well. There is gold. There are onyx stones. Maybe there is black gold under the ground. These are things for you to discover. Perhaps that is what's going on. It's connecting to the plot line of the story. That's why I like that explanation. Adam, Eve, I placed you in this wonderful place put you beautiful trees, wonderful animals. There's a river in Eden flowing out. The water is in Eden. The water source is flowing out from where God is. This is highly symbolic. Water flowing out of Eden into the rest of the nations. You obey me and have an adventure. Fill the earth and multiply. Verse 15 says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So we, here we have Adam's second job description. In the earlier verse, we saw that Adam was a gardener. He was meant to work the land. But now we are given extra detail, more information. He's meant to work it and keep it. Adam is not only the guardian, not only the gardener, he's also the guardian. He is the protector of this garden. I wonder whether he immediately said, oh, there must be danger coming. There must be danger coming. If somebody asks you to protect this, that means, I'm guessing, Danger is on the horizon. I wonder if he was alert to that danger. Verse 16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of the tree. Of the knowledge of good and evil. Sorry, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what is this tree all about? God is the one in the Garden of Eden who knew what was good and bad. He had the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve was meant to just have faith. If God says this is good, that is good. If God says this is bad, that's bad. This ties in well with our morning worship service. In America, there is this phrase, if, if you say it's Monday, it's Monday. If God says it's Monday, it is Monday. We don't say, well, I think it's Sunday because I'm at church. No, if God says it's Monday, it is Monday. 
when God says something is good, that is good. God says it is bad, it is bad. What God is asking Adam and Eve to do here by not eating from the tree is to trust God. Have faith in me. You just live. When I tell you to do something, you do it. Have faith in me. I have knowledge of good and evil. When Adam and Eve decided to disobey and eat from this tree, what they are saying is, Lord, or God, I don't trust you. I want to know. I want to decide. I want to know what is good and evil myself, and then I will do it if I'm convinced. God was saying, have faith. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of it, you will surely die. That's what they did. And they did die on that day. God was correct. They did die. Sin entered into the world. Along with that, pain, sickness, sorrow, misery. Every single day, this morning, I, after the morning service, there was a man who was so troubled, so distraught. This is the impact of sin. What can you do? What can you do? God come, came and told Adam, do not eat from this tree. If you eat, you will die. God is telling you this evening, eat from this tree. If you eat, you will live. Please turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 53 and 54. So Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Come eat from this tree and you will live. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were asked not to eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. On this tree, there is good as well, infinite goodness hanging on that tree. On this tree, there was evil and sin and suffering poured out upon this infinitely good man. This is a tree of good and evil as well. The good man, infinitely good man, is Jesus. You need to come, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood and live. Paul and Peter in the New Testament, they often talk about Jesus dying on a tree. It's very strange because they knew that Jesus died on a cross. But in Acts and other passages, Peter, Galatians, we see Paul and Peter talking about Jesus dying on a tree. I think they are making the connection with the original tree in the Garden of Eden. They're trying to make a connection. That tree brought death. This tree brings life. It may look like it is a tree where there is death and pain, shame, ah, but it's a tree that brings life to all who believe in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You need to come to Jesus. 
see him on that tree, hanging there. He despised the shame for your sake. He just rejected the shame, despised it, so that you don't have to feel shame. You know, in the Garden of Eden, they were promised to be like God. You will know good and evil. Actually, in one sense, Satan was right. He's always partially true, isn't he, Satan? They did find out about evil, uh, but I don't think they wanted to do, find out that way. When they were running away in shame and fear, they must have said, oh, so this is what evil is like. This is what bad is like. I don't think they wanted that. They're supposed to be like gods. What kind of a god runs away in fear, covering themselves up because of their shame? Outside the Eden, they, have, they may have said, oh yeah, now I know what goodness is, what good is. See, that's why we ate the fruit. Now I know what it is. Remember how good it was in Garden of Eden? When you do not trust God with your life, you learn the hard way. Come and trust God with your choices. Jesus died on a cross for you. If you make that choice this evening to trust Jesus, it will be the best decision and the best choice that you've ever made. The ripple effect of that choice will go on and on. I promise you that. You will be a great blessing to your family. You'll be a great blessing to your friends. You will begin to love the cross. You might even start boasting about the cross. It will change you. You will start cherishing that old rugged cross. Yes, some people look at it and see it as an emblem of suffering and shame. But to you, it will be different. We're going to sing on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. So please stand while we sing this song.
Let's pray. Lord, I pray that there will be someone here who clings to that old rugged cross. Lord, I pray that your word will minister powerfully to the people, Lord, who have heard it. Lord, you are the God who can change the impact of poor decisions in our life. All things work together for the good of those who love him, for those who are the called according to his purpose. Lord, I pray that there will be someone here who claims that verse and changes their life so that you get involved and you are able to change those bad decisions into good. Wash them clean, Lord. Give them a white garment. Cover them with your righteousness. May they be able to sing to you for the rest of their life. May they rejoice and dance and be glad every single day of their life. I pray that your blood and the cross will be precious to them. In the name of Jesus, amen.